Good afternoon. I know everyone is tired a bit, but I hope the conference has been fruitful and I can hear a lot of conversations. And we had, even the conference sessions were amazing, right? So, you know, we started yesterday and I was so nervous before it. I mean, I lost my sleep. I usually don't lose my sleep on many things. But I was up at 4 o'clock and I saying, oh, I have not called the videographer. I have not called this. I haven't called this, you know, snacks or whatever. So we are here now. And um, after this, we'll have a concert uh, around uh, 7.30. And speakers can meet us outside, okay, so that we can walk together. Um, and thank you so much. So people are thanking me. I want to thank our scholars and guests who came long distances. I know you all are very busy and it's not easy to pick up and leave. So we really, really appreciate, Fresno State appreciates you. <laughs> so there is a lot of work goes behind the scenes, as you know. And my helpers, my Susan Lamb, who came all the way from Hawaii to help me out, my dear friend. <laughs> and uh, Ruth Aprecio, who'll be there at the dinner, I mean, our DEA, I mean, amazing. Without her, I could not have done it. Um, and Benjamin Kirk, oh my goodness, I made his life hard. He'll be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> And Eric, who is uh, recording and diligently putting up with a lot of uh, technology issues. And above all, our students. Um, they will be there tonight, so I'll thank them there. But they have been an amazing group of students who have been sitting and, you know, manning the tables and doing all what was needed for me. So again, thanks to our student. Um, Thanks to our community, my colleagues who are, every um, session was moderated by one of our colleagues. And so it's amazing though, it took a whole community to get it all together. So they all deserve thank you, not just me. <clears throat> uh, one announcement, Ila Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's granddaughter is coming to Fresno State. So Gandhi's celebration continues, uh, <laughs> continues uh, October 14th. 14 mm -hmm. uh, at the no North Gym. And if you are a student or, um, you know, can come, whoever, uh, please do attend. Again, the uh, event is free to public. Do come and support uh, Dr. Kapoor and also enjoy the lecture. Okay, um, let's uh, now this afternoon's, the last keynote is by Nipun Mehta. I didn't know whether we were going to get him. He's so busy and so well sought after, but he uh, kindly agreed to uh, my invitation or accepted our invitation, and he's here. He's such an inspiring figure. I told my students, if you can, please do come to his talk, and if you can go online, and he's all over the web, he's just such a, I feel inspired by him, and I'm sure he'll just really do a great closing for um, this conference. So Nipun Mehta is the founder of servicespace.org, you can check, uh, an incubator of projects that support a gift culture. I just love that. You know, we like receiving gifts on Christmas or ever, and he has really create, wanted to create a culture of gifts where we can have rejoicing all the time. In his mid-20s, Nipun quit his job. In mid-20s, I mean, it's okay if you could in 40s or 50s, but 20s? <laughs> That's cool, we want to hear more about that. How are you doing? <laughs> um, and he became a full-time volunteer. And over the last 15 years, his work has reached millions, attracted more than 500,000 volunteers, uh, um, and mushroomed into numerous projects like Daily Good, uh, Awakening, Awaking Circles, and Karma Kitchens. Among his many prestigious accolades, President Obama appointed him on a council for social change. The Dalai Lama, recognized him as an unsung hero of compassion. Uh, one of his most formative experiences was a walking pilgrimage across India with his wife. Nipun's mission statement in his life reads, bring smiles in the world and stillness in the heart. Thank you so much. Please help me welcome Nipun.
I am so happy to be here. Um, but I feel like, you know, like a student is giving a presentation and all the professors are going to check the work. So I, I, I don't know how. I'm not a Gandhian scholar, but I have been a great fan of Gandhi and somebody who's tried to implement a lot of his values in the modern context. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit. I'm from the Silicon Valley, so we like to put version numbers on everything, you know, so we, we don't put spare Gandhi either. Uh, at least I don't. Uh, and I'll tell you more about what I mean by Gandhi 3.0, but I want to talk, start off a little bit about um, the, the Gandhi part uh, and how I see him and its role in our world today. I had the good fortune of, I have the good fortune of uh, earlier today we were talking about uh, Gandhi and being in his presence. I've had the good fortune of being uh, with many people who knew Gandhi personally, who knew, who spent decades with Vinoba, who was Gandhi's successor in India. Um, this was one of them, he was just here in April, Arun Dada. Um, you know, in his early 20s, he met Vinoba and he says, my life is dedicated to him and, and for decades he was with him. Now, this guy, if I had to introduce him in one sentence, uh, it would be that he's never, he never sold his labor in his life. And you think about that, and he had family, he had two kids, and you say, oh, how is that even possible? How can you not sell your labor? And he says, well, whenever you give, genuinely give, you create a bond, you create an affinity. And if you have enough of those affinities, you are held. And he's clearly a living example of it, right? And this was something that Gandhi and Vinoba spoke a lot about. But then you ask him these questions about Gandhi and Vinoba. You know, so even the doubtful sort of childlike questions, nonviolence, does it, can it really work? Like if people are holding out guns and he'll tell you stories. He says, yeah, I was part of the Shanti Sena peace army. And so we would go into regions where, you know, two sides are fighting. And he gave us this example. He's in Cyprus where the Greeks and the Turks are fighting. He goes in, he doesn't know the language, he doesn't know anything. All he's armed with is love. And he walks in and, you know, and, and he's living there. He's hosted by a whole bunch of local folks. And he says, you know, these uh, right in the morning, at some point he was going to go up to the, a hill to do his prayers. And these two kids come up with guns and they don't know who he is. He looks foreign. They don't know what to do with him. Do you shoot? Do you not? And Arun Dada that's his name, Arundada, looks at the kids without any fear. And he kind of pats them in the eyes, he pats them on the head, and he's like, oh, you kids with guns. Oh, you guys with violence. You think that's going to solve anything? No, you guys, I'm going to bless you no matter what. And the kids don't know what, how, what to do with this like, sweet old man. They don't do anything. He goes up, finishes his prayers, and by the time he comes down, true story, this guy goes out, these two kids go out to their huts, bring a whole bunch of peanuts and make an offering to this man. He took that fear, composted it in the hearts of others and turned it into an offering of love through peanuts. And you look at that and you're like, that's crazy. Like, how do you do that? And he says, this is the power of soul force. And you say, okay, I need to learn a little bit more, right? What's going on? What is this whole... Phenomena, what, what is the power of love? We tend to reduce love to sentimentality, right? Because that's what you see of love is like Hollywood, Bollywood, if you're in India. Uh, but having been with a lot of these people, I think it helps us raise these questions. And, and to your point, Mary, you were saying like, how do you create a new world order while staying in the old? Right? How do you see the possibilities? I think that's a really important question. But one of the main things that I've been around many Gandhian scholars and also people living it, and there's this very significant distinction. Because when you read Gandhi on paper and you say, how do you solve this problem? People will give you theoretical answers, but their entire consciousness is not embedded in actually responding, just their head is. So when you look at some of these people, if there's a very key point of sort of bifurcation that happens. When you ask what happens, when you ask a scholar, I don't know what they would think, um, but when you ask a living, practicing embodiment of sort of soul force, someone who has tried, maybe not to the extent of Gandhi or Vinoba, but to their own extent, when you ask them, what happens when a satyagraha fails? 
When we try, we say, I see this injustice, I want to solve this problem, I want the world to be my kind of view. What happens if that fails? A practicing satyagrahi, somebody who's embodying this as a way of life will say, if that doesn't work, you make your satyagraha gentler. And if the gentler satyagraha doesn't work, you make it even gentler, even subtler. Not, oh, this didn't work. Okay, these guys are never going to fix themselves, so let me get a bigger hammer. Let me get even a bigger hammer, right? which is usually subtly what we do, what we try to manipulate, but these living folks tell us the other way. And I think I'll... Let's see, okay, I've got, I've got like amazing, uh, or I get excited about these stories because it's, I, I personally get excited. I don't know if you'll get excited, but this is a story of gentleness. One of my friends in brief, he was a martial artist and he got into a fight, he, he, he had to, his opponent was somebody much bigger and so he kept running around and this guy's like chasing him. So his coach takes him out and he says, okay, take this rock, throw it as far as you can. And he's like, summons all his things and throws it really far. He says, take this leaf, throw it as far as you can. And he says that if you see the world as a rock, if it is solid, if it is material, you are going to respond in a very gross, violent way, in a coercive way, in a way of domination, me versus you. If you see it as a leaf, all of a sudden your response is going to be very different. And so what happens? How do we, can we create this sort of critical mass of this kind of gentleness, this kind of subtlety of love that was soul force? My wife and I went on this walking pilgrimage across India. And to your point again, Mary, I, various things you said yesterday really landed for me. Uh, to your point, you said there's so many people, so many projects that haven't been documented that the real impact of Gandhi, we tend to think of as independence, but I would beg to defer. I mean, that's just what's documented. That's just what's visible. That's just what's like the stone that you can't miss. But actually, he was working at so many levels in so many dimensions. And when you walk across India, like I did, like my wife did, and we would walk and eat whatever food is offered and sleep wherever place is offered, you meet these remarkable gems and you ask them, man, you have dedicated your life. Nobody knows who you are. You are just serving for the love of it. What inspired you? And they will say, oh man, there was that one time when Gandhi was passing through and I saw him and I was like, oh, there's some substance there. I want to be like that when I grow up. And for the next 60 years, they do that. And this is not one person. You, I'm willing to bet that none of you have heard of any of these people or the dozens more that we met that have just dedicated their lives. It's not even that they're everyday heroes because when you say everyday heroes, you're comparing them to the non-everyday heroes. But these guys are just like doing their stick. They're living it. And that living is reward in and of itself. So I think there's Gandhi the leader, and you can keep on debating. Did he give in too much on this side? Did he give in too much to these folks? Should he have done more? Should he have, is this the right stance in between? And you can debate if, if that makes you, uh, if you're jazzed by that kind of an inquiry, fantastic, go for it. But for me, what really inspires me about Gandhi is he looked at social change. And we usually look and say, hey, let's create political change, and that will create social change. And we look at bottom up and we say social change will then create political change. But Gandhi went one notch deeper, right? Not only bottom up from social to political, he actually said that before you get to social, you have to start from inner change. Inner change creates social change, which then ripples into, and that inner change is so significant. And what I love about him is Gandhi the man. Right? This man was seeking to be and continuing to seek to be, uh, be the change. When a reporter asked him, what's your message? It was a Monday, it was his day of silence. And he takes the reporter's pen and paper, he's like, my life is my message. How many people can actually say that? His work is not his message. His words are not his message. What the actions he did are not his message. The experiments he might have succeeded in or failed in or too ludicrous to even name kind of experiments was not his message. His life was his message. His presence was his message. And yet we kind of reduce him and cheapen it to just saying, oh, well, he just created this kind of change. That happened. Surely he was a part of it. 
but there was a lot more to him. And so I'm inspired by that. And I think he said this. He actually technically didn't say this. What he said was something even deeper than you must be the change you wish to see in the world. He says, we but mirror the world around us. The tendencies present in the outer world are to be found inside. This is why he says inside change goes to outside, which then ripples into systemic change. Because he knew this at a very deep level. How many of us usually look at problems on the outside and say, oh, where is it in my body? Unless you have a keen sense of awareness, that question even doesn't make sense. But for Gandhi, that made perfect sense. And he says, if we could change ourselves, then we change the tendencies and, and the world. So as a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. This is the divine mystery. He says, I can't explain this, but I'm living it, and this is what I see. Now, that was Gandhi the man. Those were his experiments. And that ignited soul force. You've probably heard of Eknath Ishwaran. You heard his uh, Bacha Khan reference. Eknath Ishwaran, if you hear his story, when Gandhi would fast, he barely saw Gandhi in like a crowd. He never actually met Gandhi one on one. But Eknath Ishwaran sees Gandhi, or not sees Gandhi, he hears that, oh, Gandhi is fasting. Even if he doesn't hear it, he cannot eat himself. Like Gandhi had this effect. I'm fasting, I'm in a whole different part of the world. You may or may not even agree with all the things that I'm doing, but you feel like fasting. What is the power of that? Right. This is Einstein, whom we heard various times, such great respect for Gandhi, and he says, 500 years, we won't even know who this man was. This is Tagore, who disagreed with him, but he says, man, I disagree with a lot of what he says, and he said it publicly, disagreed with him, but he says, you cannot call him Gandhi, you have to call him Mahatma, right. a great soul. This is Raman Maharishi, had no explicit social change. He was just sitting there like a saintly person, not just sitting there. If we could all just sit there, like the world would be a very different place. But he was a man who was not very attached to many things. When people are like, oh, when you die, you know, what are we going to do? He, and he would look at them and he says, who dies? This sense of I is the biggest problem that you have, and that's why you keep suffering. So this man was not really worried about all the worldly, mundane things, and yet when Gandhi's assassinated, he has tears in his eyes. Is he going to miss Gandhi, or is he, what, what, what does he have tears for? Right. Dalai Lama, of course, dedicated his Nobel Peace Prize. Dalai Lama, when he's a teenager, goes to Gandhi's grave. That's actually where he got his inspiration. He had a vision at Gandhi's grave. And he says, I have to embrace nonviolence. Obama, of course, uh, had great respect for Gandhi. He had a photo of him in his office. And, and, and I think that soul force is what gets Gandhi to write something like this. He says, dear friend, I, that I address you as a friend is no formality. I own no foes. My business in life has been for the past 33 years, to enlist the friendship of the whole of humanity by befriending mankind, irrespective of race, color, or creed. That was his letter to Hitler. That's how it started. This was his second one, I think, in 1940. And of course, I mean, you have two polar extreme, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of approach, and Gandhi says, dear friend, and he's like, by the way, I'm not just saying that. So, you know, I, I, I could tell you a lot more about how Gandhi fasted. A lot of people think, oh, fasting is coercion. Of course it is coercion. Right? A man of deep nonviolence is not going to say, oh, well, you guys should agree. If you don't, I'm going to blackmail you by fasting. But why was Gandhi fasting? What was his logic? What was going on through him? Turns out Vinoba explicitly asked him. And he says, Oh, I listen. my inner voice told me. And so Vinoba, a very mathematical guy, he says, well, what do you mean inner voice? Like, how do you, why, why 20? Well, you fasted for 21 days. Why 21 days? Why not 20? Why not 22? And he says, that's what my inner voice told me. And that inner voice, this salt march, Narayan Desai, Gandhi's secretary's son, who spent time with Gandhi, was the one who told me this story. Narayan Desai says, two weeks before the Dandi March, Tagore happens to be going past the ashram. And Tagore says, hey, the whole country is waiting to see what you're going to say, what you're going to do. 
right? The British are like, oh, what he's got, he's scheming, he must have think tanks, what's he doing? He's got like, he had access to everybody in the country. He's like, what are they doing? The next steps. You know what he tells Tagore? He says, I don't know the next steps, but you can be sure that I'm praying. Gandhi's strategy was a tad bit different than how we might strategize in a situation like this when you got 350 million people looking to say, hey, what do we do next? He's sitting there praying. But the challenge, of course, one of my friends comes up to me, he knows how much of a fan of Gandhi I am, and he comes up to me, he says, you know, Nipun, Gandhi had it easy. I said, okay, say more. He says, Gandhi had it relatively easy. He says, I admire Gandhi, but you know, in his time, you could spot the opponent, because they didn't look like him. Right? He says, you know, you look at Rosa Parks, yeah, you can spot by her skin color what's going on. But you go a little farther, this is Tiananmen Square, this is Mr. Anonymous Man, right? Such a powerful example of resisting. He was a teacher, but we don't really know his name. Still, we can spot him. This becomes a little harder. This is the first glacier to melt. Right? Larsen C, that's the name of this glacier. You're like, oh, global ah, climate change. Ooh. Where did it start? What's that one cause that fixes it? We haven't been able to fix it. Inequality. People in this golf cart, eight men, own more financial wealth than the bottom 3.5 billion. Like it's a system, we're all in the system when we engage with it. Nobody likes it, but this is what the end product of it is. And this is what I was with the best of the folks, smartest folks in the country, looking at addressing poverty and inequality in this country at the White House. Nobody really knows how to solve inequality. It's getting worse and worse. And you'd think it would stop here. I used to quote this when it was like 160 or whatever people. And it's like, you know, it just got worse and worse. And then it was like, not just people, it was just eight men. And you would think it'll stop here, but now technology is gonna give us even more leverage. And so where are we gonna go with this? You look at a tomato. The two tomatoes look the same, not, not quite as easy, but one of them is genetically modified. You go even one step further. This is Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, announcing a multi-billion dollar takeover of uh, Oculus Rift, this virtual VR game. There are, he's announcing this grand big thing, and guess what? No one's even looking at him. They released this. This is not like some selfie, right? Their Facebook themselves is releasing it and saying, look, this is where, you know, it's like, so now it gets even more subversive because you, you, we, we, you know, refresh our screens 20, 2,600 times a day. We don't even know it. But they've, they study rats, then they create all these different patterns, and you keep on... You know, you, you, you keep on going on this treadmill and you say, wow, where's the opponent there? It's all happening inside me. And you go one step further. I saw this in the Washington Post uh, just a couple weeks ago. Hey, Google, let me talk to my departed father. And you say, oh, what do you mean? It turns out that, you know, when I SMS you, when I text you, if instead I go through this machine and then when you pass away, this machine kind of knows how you would respond. And so it responds directly as if I'm talking to my dad who's passed away. Okay. Is that really going to ignite soul force to design for permanence? Or should we actually embrace change and impermanence? and go with nature, and these are multi-billion dollar companies, right? This is, their, this is one of the companies featured in the Washington Post article. Never lose someone you love. This is another company, Eternum. Who wants to live forever? Like, this is mainstream. This is where billions of dollars are going to support this kind of a worldview. And so you start, you, you sort of start and end here, that we design who we are. We be the change, what change are we being? And this is where Gandhi has so much to offer. This is where Gandhi has incredible amount to offer, that there is this great suffering that is happening in the world, but with that suffering, in this infinity, there is 
the possibility for great compassion. But the Gandhian approach to it was you don't build on the foundation of military. The government, the state, somebody asked a question the other day. You don't build on the foundation of markets. Dolores, this morning, talked about volunteerism. But she, she sadly said that that was Cesar's vision, but it died with him. So we don't know, right? What are the great examples of Gandhian social change that are beyond the market? You'd be hard pressed to find any. And media. Not communication in the way you said it. I, I read your article, which is beautiful. Not communication, because Gandhi was a great communicator, obviously. But this mass media, which is so sensational, which is so one after another after a third, and which is broadcast. And when you're broadcasting, and when I, when I pander to that, it changes the way in which you design. If you keep pandering to that kind of a mindset, you're not going to be able to create a field of soul force because you start devolving, and we, we know where we land with that. Um, so these three M's, right? But they exist in the world, so we can't ignore them. But what Gandhi would do is compost them. Compost means you're, you're putting it under the ground. So, you, you know, the, the fruit is what you talk about, right? You talk about the mangoes, but you don't talk about, like, what's the fertilizer. So how do you learn to compost it and keep it under the ground? That you don't lead with that. You lead with love. You lead with soul force. You lead with nonviolence. You lead with great compassion in the presence of suffering. So really, this is money, power, and fame. And so most of us would be hard-pressed that if you didn't have power, if you didn't have money, if you don't lead with fame, then what would you do and how would you do it? Because even to hold this question seems so radical, seems so out there. You're like, wait, wait that's not, how is that possible? Sort of like when Arunda that comes and tells you, I've never sold my labor. Guess what? My mom has never sold her labor when giving to me either. So we all know it. Nine months of free labor is how we all come into this world. No exceptions. We didn't have a transaction. And yet, at some point, we start believing that if I don't do quid pro quo, it's not going to really work. I won't survive. And you're like, wait a second. Is that a crazy story or is Arundada's story crazy? So how do you start to compost these things and you know, I, I won't go into these because you all already know the stories of how Gandhi would take, you know, the, the military example and turn him into a friend. And this friend whom he defeated, Jan Schmutz, says, man, what an honor to have lost to you, right? that you were my antagonist. Markets, you know, this, this is what Gandhi died with. These are his possessions when he died. And the media, when he, when he wrote the story of my experiments with truth, he sent the first book to Vinoba, his buddy, and he's like, hey, what do you think, man? Give me a little 411 on, like, what's the book? How's, is it good? Vinoba says, well, I don't think it can hurt anybody. You're like, oh, well, nice to have you as a friend, Vinoba. <laughs> you know, at least give a little encouraging word. No, nothing. And you know what Gandhi's response to that was? He says, good, because the sole purpose of all this is to be zero. He's not trying to be somebody. He's not trying to create, like, be the next, you know, dawn of... You know, he's actually trying to be zero. Who writes an article to try to be zero? Who writes a book? Who leads a country to lead to zero? But this man, only such a man, would have no security. It's very easy to assassinate Gandhi. Many people tried before God say. But he refused to have any protection. He says, look, if you're going to assassinate me, the joke's on you. Because what am I going to do? I'm going to bless you because that's what I do all the time. That's my practice. That's what I do with Hitler. That's what I do with my critics. That's what I do with my opponents. Go ahead, come right in. Everyone knows, 6 o'clock, prayer time. Very easy to find him. He refused to. So media, right? So I'm going to address, touch a little bit on the Gandhi 3.0 part. So this is Gandhi. This is Gandhi that we all know, we all love. Maybe you parse it a little bit differently. This, for me, is how I parse Gandhi, and it's been very inspiring for me to even attempt to bring this much of it in my own life. But now the question is, how, how do we apply it in our current era? And, and I think in the times of Gandhi, we call it, I, I think of it as Gandhi 1.0, that one of him, many of us, 
you look at him on the stage and you say, oh my God, like that's a godly man. I could never be like that. I'm going to follow. Right? That's not probably not what he would have wanted. Not probably, definitely not. Post him, Vinoba Bhave. All of you, if, if, if you went to uh, Anshu's session, you would know that, you know, you would know all about Vinoba. He did unprecedented, right? We fight for decades over small pieces of land. Here is this man who had the audacity to walk into a village and he says, hey, brother, you know, if, if you have a lot of land and your, and your other brother or your other sister doesn't have land, why don't you give it? And the logic was that if you had five kids, what would you do with your extra land when you passed away? I would distribute it amongst the five. He says, would you adopt me as your sixth son? And I don't want the one-sixth of your land. I want you to give it over there. And that one-sixth added up to five million acres. Absolutely unprecedented in human history. Who even has the audacity to go in? No market, no media, no military, just love. And these are, like, if you hear these stories in some mythical thing, you might be like, oh, yeah, okay, really? But these are people that we know. These are people that we have access to, people who walked with him. There are so many people that I know who walked with him on this pilgrimage, and they were like, wow, really? This is how it works. This is just love. Yeah, this is soul force. But what, what Vinoba did is he could have been the giant leader that Gandhi was. Because Gandhi had huge respect for him. In fact, a lot of deference on spiritual topics. He would say, go to Vinoba if you have a spiritual question. But Vinoba walked village to village. And what he did was not one to many. He did one to one. And what both of them talked about, Gandhi less so, but Vinoba very explicitly said that now we are in the future. We're going to see Gandhi 3.0. They didn't say Gandhi 3.0. But in Vinoba's words, he says, what goes up. Oh, this is Vinoba. Uh, Vinoba doing one-to-one, -one, heart to heart, but what he said was what goes up as a fountain must come down as distributed drops. He says what we have done here, this giant sort of pilgrimage, has awakened this kind of a soul force and it will spread. He says from Jai Hind, victory to India, and the Hind region in India, to Jai Jagat, glory to the planet. Right? And he said that that glory that resurgence will be many to many, not one to one. So to put it in another context, to give you a visual, this is one to many, this is one to one, and this is many to many. And network theory, I'll bring in, I'll bring in a little bit of my Silicon Valley hat. Right? Network theory tells you that in a one to many, right, one of me, 50 of us, 50 of you, how many connections would you have? 50. In one-to-one, -one, a lot of times people get greedy about connecting with each other. Let's, like, like, let's do that. That's great. Okay, business settings, you, people do that a lot. Um, it's Metcalf's law, one-to-one. -one, you have 1,225 connections, room full of just 50 people. In a many-to-many -many network, what you see on the internet is Reed's law. In a room full of just 50 people, where you have a group-forming network, the number of connections, unique connections that are possible is a hundred million trillion. You cannot try to pocket this. Only a man of grace, a man of surrender, woman of grace, woman of surrender, is able to hold all of this. So what it requires, another visual on it, is to go from centralized to decentralized to distributed. And we have tried this, of course, this is not a new phenomenon because we have tried this for profit. We have tried this for protest too, right? Arab Spring, no central leader, no money, no, no you know, they, people didn't know where it started and create monumental change. But that was for protest. We haven't done it for soul force. We haven't done it for love. And that's the call of the hour. Right. Can we actually ignite? If you look at that distributed network, what happens when those bonds, you can, do it for pro, you can do it for profit, you can do it for greed, you can do it for anger, but those bonds are not going to be as deep. Even between us, right? We say, let's create a startup together. Right. Let's do this. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Okay, we can have a connection. Or let's say we both hate this person together. You can have a connection. Not going to be as deep as if you say, let's serve others together. And what, ha what is a network exponential effect of that kind of change? 
So to hold this, we talk about this idea of leadership to laddership. I, 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 I'll skip it, but it's actually significantly different. You go from plan and execute to search and amplify. It's no longer about planning, because plan and execute means you're, this is my five-year plan, this is how we're going to execute. That's the old school way. But now, things are moving so fast that if you create a five-year plan in your Facebook, you're already out, you're, you're done, man, because in two years, everything's changing. So in that era of rapid change, plan and execute no longer makes sense. So search and amplify, but how are you going to search? You have to have the eyes. So being the change gives you the eyes in which you look at all of this. So there's a lot to unpack with laddership, and we do these laddership circles uh, with people from all around the world. Um, but I'll leave you with three sort of core shifts right, um, that we've been practicing. So service space is this ecosystem of projects uh, that aim to create a gift culture. We do lots of projects and it reaches lots of people. Um, you can check it all out online. But if you ask me, well, okay, how, what are the core shifts right, from our experience of 20 years of doing this? Um, I would leave you with this. First thing is to shift from money to wealth. That we tend to equ equate money equals wealth that's not quite true. Money is a form of wealth, but there are so many forms of wealth. And how do you start to really tap in, tap into this? Um, there's a beautiful story of Mother Teresa. I'll, I'll skip it um, in the interest of more dialogue with all of you. Uh, this is a guy whose son was autistic, and it took him a long time to recover from that hit. At the age of 36, uh, Firoz, Muslim guy, uh, at the age of 36, he had 5,000 people reporting under him uh, at SAP, right? Real hot shot. Then he has an autistic child, and he doesn't know what to do. He's totally confused and lost and depressed, and then he realizes this is his calling, and he goes and he hires five people on the autistic spectrum, and he realizes that, well, wait a second. They never lie. They're never late. They don't get bored. Oh, why had I just looked at their lacks? They actually have a lot of talents. And he became a Harvard case study. And now so many Fortune uh, 500 companies are, are embracing his pledge. Really remarkable, but what he teaches us is that there are so many kinds of capital. But we have no markets. We, for money, we do so many things to move all these things around. But for, you know, what are we doing for time capital? Right? What are we doing for compassion capital? Do we even know what culture capital is? You know, there's so many question marks that come up, but this is a whole different conversation to be had. Um, and and you know, there's a lot more to unpack there. But how do we encourage multiple forms of wealth, multiple forms of capital? How do we design for that? Vina said, you know, oh, Gandhi kept rich people around him. I, I, I would augment that to say even rich people flocked to Gandhi because they were like, man, this dude is able to do stuff without the power of money. Money is compost. He's using it. But if he really wanted money, he had the world's, or he had the country's richest people telling him, but judges of the world saying, hey, adopt me as your son. I want to give you everything. Instead, he goes village to village to get like one earring from a villager, which is the only thing he had. Is that good use of your time if all you're after is money? Gandhi was not after money, but Gandhi knew that there are so many forms of capital that we need to unlock, and he designed for that. Right? The second thing is to go from broadcast to deep cast. And you're like, oh, I've never heard the word deep cast. I hadn't either until Arundada told me. Because people would go to Vinoba and says, oh, you're doing amazing things. Attenborough at least made a film on Gandhi. Nobody's even made a film, a proper film on Vinoba. And yet he did something so remarkable. So all these like whiz kids would go up to Vinoba and says, oh, you're, you know, that's kind of great, but like, wouldn't it be great if you used marketing and you had this plan and you did this and you did that? He says, you know what he says? He says, the wind is my, are my volunteers. The, the rivers will carry my message. Everything is alive in the universe and I'm connected to all of it. And what Arundada says is that this is deep cast. And most of us, you go to young people, right? you say, okay, what's your communication strategy? And you look at this and you're like, oh, that's so far out. What do you mean? Like, you got to be on social media and you got to put it. And you do, yes, but we've seen how shallow that goes. And we've seen to the question that someone asked Dr. Lawson yesterday, right? 
We've seen how shallow it feels even for the person and this, this bypass that we do with clicktivism. So what does it mean to go from broadcast to deepcast? I have great stories of this guy. Um, I, I'll, I'll spare you the stories in the interest of time. But he went at Occupy Oakland, he was meditating and he got arrested. And because they were stepping up the violence, the first place in you know, Oakland where you know this showdown happened, it choppers everywhere. It was like a world media event, right? It was like everybody's there, and they arrest Pancho, and Pancho is one of our core volunteers and and a real brother for me as well. And they arrest Pancho, and and his offense reads disturbing peace. Okay. <laughs> this was the photo that was on world news uh, everywhere, right? and he recently walked to the Mexico border as an undocumented person. And he says, you don't need to come get me, I'm coming to you, man. And he climbs up the wall and he puts a one earth flag on it. He says, I don't believe in these boundaries. And he's speaking to the whole machine and no one knows about him because he says he doesn't do media. Because he went out and he, he started to do, uh, it, you know, New York Times did this story because the media is so subversive nowadays. They looked at him in the middle of an interview and they were like, oh, can you say that in another way? And Pancho's like, no, this is how I say it. And they refused to do the story on him because it didn't fit their paradigm, right? So Pancho, in a way, is this very ultra radical, sure, it may not, but he's a guy who, if you ask him, hey, what difference has this made? You walked all the way, 93 days from Oakland without money, just based on relationships, all the way to the US Mexico border. Now he's in Tijuana. And you say, what difference has that made? Nobody even knows about what you're doing. And he says, oh, really? Let's see in 500 years, is broadcast going to survive or is deepcast going to survive? And it's going to be deepcast. Um, and so how do we scale on alternate metrics? Doesn't mean broadcast is useless, but we do have to kind of couple it with a deeper um, sort of deepcast. I think there's a very real thing that happens there. And lastly, I would say we need to move from transaction to trust. This is the problem with money is that it transactionalizes everything. You take a look at a multi-dimensional relationship you and I might have. You give me something, I give you something back, right? But if we start keeping track and you say, okay, I got these many ounces of neural sort of dopamine hits and you got these many, you know, this much release of oxytocin in your body and okay, now we're measuring how, you know, you could do all that kind of mathematics or you can just engage in a multi-dimensional relationship. Unfortunately, money is really good at turning everything into a transaction. It helps us strip out relationships. And when you strip out relationships, you have no trust. This is another problem that society simply doesn't know how to solve. Trust was, you know, was more or less same for about 40 years and then 2000 like dipped 40%. Between 2000 and 2010. And now 2020, they're gonna come out with more metrics. Everyone knows it's continuing to spiral down. So how can we return from transaction to relationship to ultimately trust. Right? And, and just to close with some of these examples of just in passing, I mean, I could tell you so many amazing stories, right? But this is where we, we volunteers take on a restaurant. We call it Karma Kitchen. You walk in and you have a meal and your check reads zero. It's zero because someone before you has paid for you and you are trusted to pay forward whatever you want completely in the face of dominant paradigm economics, which says we are wired, or they, they don't say wired because now there's so much science against it. They say that you will aim to maximize self-interest. So they looked at a bunch of kids like us doing this and they said, ah, yeah, that's cute, that's childish. And let's see how long it lasts. You know, went on and on and on now in 23 countries. UC Berkeley did a research on this and they said, the title of this seminal research paper, because they are like, what's going on? You know, what is actually, because it used, when we started in Berkeley, it used to be, it was like top of all the Yelp reviews, because everyone felt so great being served by volunteers, and people are like, what's going on here? It's just love. And so UC Berkeley did this research, and the title of their pa paper was Paying More When Paying for Others. And a lot of people use this in a strategic way also. They're like, oh, good, I can get more if I you know, engage with people in compassion. Our stick is, even if you pay more, man, I just trust in the deep cast for you to pay it forward. So what does that look like? And what happens in an ecosystem? You take over just one restaurant, say 50, 100 people. 
right? And no one is paying for themselves, no transactions. You're all paying forward. You're trusted to be in that community. What happens in such a space? Incredible transformations. You could try it anywhere in the world with any kinds of constraints and you'll see the same kind of phenomena. We have seen it all over the world. And not just that, we had a rickshaw driver in India. He says, you know, I really believe in love. He lives in a place that's like this big. And most of them sleep outside. This is their shared area. He needs the income from, it's like day to day. He needs that income to take care of his family. But he says, you know what? I want to change the system. And what does he do? He says, you sit in my rickshaw, no transactions. There's no meter. And you're trusted to pay forward. And people ask him, he says, so how does it work? Are you able to make it buy? He says, yeah, more or less. I still get the same amount. Some people pay more, some people pay less. But he says, that's not the real metric. He says, that's the book of my material wealth. But here is the book that you should really read. This is where I ask people, how, how did you feel sitting in my rickshaw? And people's lives are transformed. This is not Bill Gates telling you to be generous after accumulating so much. This is a guy who just believes that if I treat you with love, you will respond to that love with greater love. That if I smile, I don't run out of smiles. I actually have more smiles to give. If I hug, I have more hugs to give. This is the regenerative law of love. But our material systems are not designed in that way. So this guy is like, you know, the buzz of town. And everyone's like, who's doing this? How are you doing this? And he says, you know what? I, it's just me. And you can do it too. Turn it around. Right? This guy does it with his magazine. He says, only offerings of gratitude. Incredible magazine, art magazine. This woman does it, uh, this woman does it uh, with her acupuncture clinic. Same thing. Can you imagine going in some place and you're treated as not as like somebody who's out to suck value, but somebody who has multiple forms of wealth to give, including financial capital. It's not like being allergic to financial capital, but it's like putting it in the larger canvas. And it just creates such a deep engagement. Um, so that's the question is, how do we shift from transaction and relationships to transformation? And these are the kinds of things that many Gandhians think about. Many Gandhians live into it. And I think these are very relevant for our society. I'll skip this in the interest of time, but you know, it's a, it's a very touching, or should, it, should I play it? <laughs> okay, it, it's really powerful, it's like 60 seconds. Um, this is a clip from, um, from Attenborough's film, it's Gandhi's funeral scene. Um, and uh, it actually happened in real life too, this exact quote. The object of this massive tribute, died as he had always lived, a private man without wealth, without property, without official title or office. Mahatma Gandhi was not the commander of armies nor a ruler of vast lands. He could not boast any scientific achievement or artistic gift. Yet men, governments, dignitaries from all over the world have joined hands today to pay homage to this little brown man in the loincloth who led his country to freedom. In the words of General George C. Marshall, the American Secretary of State, Mahatma Gandhi has become the spokesman for the conscience of all mankind. He was a man who made humility and simple truth more powerful than empires. And Albert Einstein added, generations to come will scarce believe that such a one as this, ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this earth. No wealth, no property, no title, no office. Humility was his greatest weapon. You're like, how in the world did he shake the world without anything? Of course, it wasn't that he didn't have anything, but he didn't lead with any of these resources. And this is the last visual I want to leave with you. And I think it's a testimony to why we're all here in Fresno, talking and remembering Gandhi in so many amazing ways.
in so many different ways. I mean, I'm not saying this is the right way to view Gandhi. This is just my way to view Gandhi. This is just what has worked in service space. I'm just sharing that story. That's a story. There's so many amazing stories that we heard. But here was this simple man, post-independence. Nobody even wanted to go with him to Noakali. He was doing these humble acts, and here we are so many years later, remembering him, trying to embody him in whatever ways that we're moved to. And this is a photo of a living bridge in, in the state of Meghalaya. It rains a lot. They try to build these cement bridges. They come in with their systems. They come in with their tools. They come in with their architects. And they say, let's build a bridge in like X amount of time. And none of all of them collapse. But you know what stays are these living bridges. These are roots of trees connected to each other. It takes hundreds of generations to create one of these bridges. Because every generation knows that your job is to take that tiny root and connect it to the next root. And take that tiny root, the next generation will connect it to the next. And guess what? So many generations later, you have this incredibly resilient and rich bridge that is able to hold a whole lot more and that cannot be destroyed just as easily. And so you look at this, and I, th I think the call of the hour is not to go for the sensational, not to create change tomorrow, but to actually embody these principles so it creates this living bridge. And all too often, people say, well, how can I, what can I do? And I think it's about all of us tapping into that heart of compassion. Right? Outside, you'll see a bunch of smile cards. Right? Do a small act of kindness. This is an experiment. You don't have to use a smile card, but it's helpful. You do a small act of kindness, pay toll for the car behind you, tells the person you don't know who did this, it's anonymous, but don't let the chain stop with you. Pay it forward. Do something kind for somebody else. And if you think deeply about it, man, we all start with nine months of an act of kindness. Are we ever going to be able to pay it back? But are we, at some point, do we say, oh, okay, I'm done with that. Now I'm entitled to all of this. But what happens if you stop that entitlement trap and you say, look, I'm just paying forward in gratitude. Do you think we'll run out if we keep giving? Talk to people who have done that their whole lives, and they'll tell you that actually you end up getting way more back in return. And that gratitude propels you to pay forward even all that you have received. And bit by bit by bit, you create uh, incredible ripple effect, but you create an incredible field inside your heart and outside in the world. And in that field arises trust, arises transformation, and arises very different patterns of innovation. And if we're going to survive all these latest trends of monetization and commodification and marketization and militar militarization and mediaification, if we're going to survive all of that, it will need you and I to step into that place of kindness and to remember that in a gentle way, we can shake the world. Thank you so much.